We, because when you read this, it will resonate within you. So when you heard, I mean, I would really recommend listening to different varieties of the Quranic recitations. Okay. From the, the recitals of Egypt, for example, in Medina, in Morocco, in Indonesia, and in various places, and see how they recite the Quran and what touches you. Because at the end of the day, Quran is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when it's spoken to us, when the ayat of punishment is recited, you should feel horror. You should feel in your heart, subhanAllah, I mean, how could I even imagine to do something like that? To even cheat or lie or fornicate or kill someone. When you hear this ayat of Allah, when, when, when they recite it to you. Yeah, when you mean the, at the, like at the prayers, the mosque? Or you no, no, when, when you even re listen to it. When you listen to the Quran being recited about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will feel subhanAllah that Allah is so merciful. You will, it will transform you and change you in the way that, okay, why am I not merciful to the others? I should be kind and merciful to the others. Allah is so merciful. So when you, when you see that Allah has said, for example, you know, call upon me, I will respond to you. You immediately realize, I don't need to go any of these gurus or this, uh, what Please. do they call, Sufi um, masters, what are they called? I don't know, saints and peers, right? I don't need to go and tell them like, you know what, uh, here's my um, briefcase full of money, whatever, or, you know, here's the, the contracted uh, land uh, or to giving to you. Or priest. Or priest. Um, I am not having good business uh, nowadays, or uh, my wife is barren. Some people really do that. They go to these intermediaries as if they will invoke Allah on your behalf and Allah will grant your request. Allah says, Udu'uni, call upon me directly. Directly. Amen. So you don't need to go to other people. You ask Allah directly. That's why in the Quran, you know the first chapter in the Quran, is Surah Al-Fatiha. We recite this in every Salah. Beginning of all our Salah, five daily prayers. Where does we, what do we say in there? Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. You alone, you alone. We worship. The grammatical construct is such that it's not we say na'budu iyaka. It's reversed to make it iyaka na'budu means you alone. We, if somebody says we worship you, it doesn't stop saying and him and her and that and this. But the Quranic construct is such that First is only you we worship. Now, can you have anyone else in that statement that we worship him as well, her as well, that as well? Excludes all of that. That is what, what you will feel when you connect to the Quran and we recite that level of interactions with Allah and with that understanding. Yeah? So when you listen to the Quran, as I said, when you listen to the ayat of the descriptions of heaven. You will feel, subhanAllah, why am I wasting my time here? In this momentary life, in this dunya. How, Sheikh, this is uh, Sheikh Muhammad. How much in terms of time frame is this dunya compared to the hereafter in Jannah? Allah says in the Quran, this life is only like, like illusion, like compared to the hereafter. It's nothing compared to the hereafter. But Allah, Part of his blessing, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, wanted us to have the flavor of these things that we have, that we, just a flavor, just kind of an idea above the pleasure of the Akhirah. That's why when Allah promises us Jannah and the paradise and the fruits of Jannah and everything, Allah has wanted us this flavor. You can see that the fruits here and we taste it just only nothing compared to the ones in the hereafter. The life here is nothing compared to the life in the hereafter. So what we what Allah says in the Quran is just mata al Mata al like is a is a pleasure of illusion. It's like illusionary pleasure. Something that you think yeah, you, you you feel good about it. Because think about it. As soon as you had for example a good meal or as soon as you have for example between a relationship between husband and wife, we talk about the lawful ones, yeah, the lawful relationship, yeah? Yeah, or the things which is lawful to be done in this life. Yeah? Still it's temporary and it will not it will not last for long. But the hereafter is something else. The, the pleasure of it is something else, is eternal pleasure. 
So that's what Allah, you need eternal, something doesn't end. That's what Allah Adil wanted us to do. And since you mentioned about Surah al fatiha I wanted to share something important about Surah al fatiha That Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu when Surah al fatiha was revealed, when he said, by Allah, Allah didn't reveal in the Torah, in the, in, the, in the Quran, nor in the Torah, nor in the Injil, better than this Surah, Surah al fatiha and it is the great Quran that was given to the Prophet ﷺ. Because the whole Quran is summarized in Surah Al-Fatiha. Can you imagine this Quran, the whole Quran, the 114 chapters in the Quran, all of them they are summarized in one chapter, which is Surah Al-Fatiha. And the Surah Al-Fatiha, all of it is summarized in one verse, only one verse, which is Ihdina Salaam al Guys, that's the right Think about it, that Allah is giving us this introduction to start by the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, then to praise Allah Azza wa the way that, befit, that, the, the way that, that He deserves to be praised. All praise due to Allah, and then all gracious and all merciful. Then to say, and to, as well to, uh, to say, to, to identify Allah Azza wa He is the owner of the day of judgment. Meaning, when everything will, will vanish on this earth, there will be no ownership, there will be no king except him in the hereafter. He is going to be the one who owns everything, and everything will return back to him. And then to say, you address yourself to say, it is you and only you who worship, and it is you and only you who seek aid. Then Allah, that's why there is one hadith of the Prophet he said, Allah is saying that I divided the prayer between me and myself. When you say, Alhamdulillah, and said, my servant has praised me. When you say that you are the, the, the Lord or, or the owner of the Day of Judgment, then Allah will say, yes, I am the owner of the Day of Judgment. Then you will say, you say, okay, this is this for me, for my servant. What my servant wants from me. Then the next verse, which is the most important one, to say, Allah Azza wa Jal sent all the prophets and messengers alayhi salatu wa salam since Adam alayhi salam until Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam all of them they came for that the guy to the straight to the right path they came for that all of them they came for that path the path of Allah Azza wa Jal and then here for people to doubt which path is it the path of the Jews or the path of the Christian or which path which path and Allah Azza wa Jal the path of those who you have favored, who are they? And Allah Azza wa Jalla has mentioned in the Quran, "Ulaika ma'aladina an'am Allahu alayhim min al-nabiyin wa al-siddiqin wa al-shuhada wa al-salihin wa hasan alayka al-fiqah." That those are the ones, that the, the path of those ones, who, which ones? That from from those whom Allah Azza has favored, from the prophets and messengers of Allah, wa al-shuhada the martyrs. Yeah? Uh, and the truthful people and the shahada, the martyrs was salih and the pious people. This is the great compassion. This is the path that Allah to guide you to. Not the path of those who gain the anger of Allah, nor the path who went astray. So that's why when you ponder upon the Quran, you find the Quran open your horizon to understand the purpose of your life. What are you doing here? You are here. Only to submit to your will to the will of Allah. That is the purpose of this. It will be interesting to read them all. Thanks so much for the information. It's good to know because I hear the, the prayers a lot, but I never know. What they ask about, so he was saying, so he was brought up in Iran, um, and in Iran, Islam is not practiced in the way he, he likes. So, what, what were you saying just now? To, to what? That guy? Uh, basically, uh, I think in Iran, uh, the way the, especially the government and like the religion works, they have a very strict interpretation and basically it's just like very restrictive. Like you have to, you know, they have much stricter rules and I, I went to Morocco and I realized there it's more forgiving and like nobody tries to tell somebody else to do something. But in Iran they tell the woman like you have to wear the headscarf and then she can't even decide for herself if she wants to. So then yeah, because of that in Iran, a lot of people are turning away from religion because there's like someone interfering and being like, you have to do it like this, you have to listen to my interpretation. Can and I say something to you? It's actually not necessarily the case because of being strict on certain things, on strict on certain morality, because of the confusion between morality. You prohibit 
you know, fornication. You prohibit this. You prohibit prostitution. But you allow as a muta, you allow siga there. You allow it, which is an indirect prostitution. I mean, what's these contradictions? That's the people they will pay from there. You see this contradiction? Okay, they say someone, they allow, for example, they allow, they allow even transgender in Iran. And they allow them, and they, they, they work, and they do muta, they do all of these things. And then you say, what's going on here? You, you think, here. These things you don't allow, for example, someone having, for example, uh, you know, the, you know, the what do you call it, intercourse with, with, with the same gender. They don't allow it. But at the same time, someone who's transgender that is entitled to do that. So all of these contradictions, of course, people do believe in the faith. They, because of the contradiction, because there is no true faith, there is no true understanding of Islam. Let alone the shirk, the major shirk, which is black. God, God, Allah is saying to us to worship Him, not to worship the Imam, not to worship Ali, not to worship anyone. We, we follow, we follow those, we follow those people of Lula. We follow them. We follow the, the Sahaba of the Prophet. We follow the, the Ahl Bayt. No problem with this. But when it comes to, to the interpretation of Islam, it has to be strictly with the Imam. How is that? But why the Quran? Allah, why Allah has read the Quran? Why the Quran has? apparent meaning that could be understood by everyone and has indirect meaning could be understood by only the Imam. That's not right. You understand? That's why people do this because it doesn't make sense. But that's why we are advising to, to, under, to learn the Quran and to learn the Sunnah, the true Sunnah of the Prophet and there is no hidden meanings in the Quran. The Quran is clear. Because that's what Allah said, with a pure Arabic tongue. Pure, clear, obvious. Not something which is ambiguous, only the Imams are entitled to interpret it. That's why people don't believe it, because they say, if the Imam knows, why need to know? So I'll leave it. just want to address another point about strict interpretation of something having no choice. You see, when we say we are Muslims, what we are saying is we are submitting and surrendering our will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's a point where you have to say, okay, I forfeit my choice, my liberty, and I will only follow these instructions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though I have my liberty to choose otherwise. So if Allah says, for example, do not eat pork, people have their liberty to eat or not eat. But as a Muslim, you will say, I'm not going to take the liberty that I have, but I will forfeit the liberty, but I will surrender willingly and submit willingly to Allah and His instruction, and I will not eat pork or porcine materials, for example, and you will not consume any of that. So, so when Allah says, for example, how the believers, men and women, should dress and how should they interact in society, in public, you, you can have your own libertarian choice in which, you know what, so like, I want to not dress at all. I want to go naked um, at work and whatever, whatever. You have the free choice and the thinking that you have. No one's going to take that away from you. But that is going to be restricted. Even in your workplace, you can't just say, you know what, today I'm going to go to work, I'm naked. Your employers will prevent you from even coming to work in this attire, right? Well, no attire at all, right? There's restrictions for a reason. So Allah, when He puts restrictions, it's for our own benefit, for our own good. So just because the state is also a state, meaning a functional body in which it enforces through a legislative body with policing and so on and so forth with a criminal system in which people do and then they're gone into a just system of looking at whether it's a crime happened or not if a state system regulates these do's and don'ts of our creator it becomes like a theocratic state but there's inherently nothing wrong with that because what this system is trying to do is trying to implement the laws of God in a collective level because Islam didn't come, my brother, in a personal level only. Yeah, but then they interfere with other. Forget about them. Faith. I'm not talking about. I'm because not talking about them. You know, I'm they, talking about the very idea of a a body of systems in which people's collective life is governed. The Jewish pagans them from you, they're not Jews. That's right. They ask how they come from you. People's life in public, collective life. When does not teach the truth, it's okay. Is Mohammed our enemy? No. We pay Mohammed Jizya to protect us in the Middle East. The white man come down there and kill us all. Right, Sheikh? In 1948, they came to where? Middle East. Were they before? How comes the 
Oh, okay. comes the president. Let me just continue. Of Egypt this, says, it's just having an issue with the beef with someone over there, right? Mm -hmm. Never mind. So what we're saying is, when Allah legislates, He doesn't legislate individually what you do at your own bedroom only. He legislates so that you can interact and live in society. Yep. How you communicate with other people, how you look at and maintain the rights of another individual. Do you just steal because you feel like so, or do you say no? I don't have no right. Killing, oppressing, all of these are involved in that system. So when, for example, a system is implemented in a societal level, that is the kingdom of God that God wants us to live in by, so that we can all benefit and we can be all protected from harm, from unfairness, from injustice, and so on and so forth. Their particular model in Iran may be the wrong model, maybe the model that is inappropriate, maybe the model that shouldn't work because it's based on fundamentally the wrong principles. That's why it's not working. But it doesn't remove this um, individual obligation of how Muslims should dress. So if God commands women to draw their veils over their bosoms, the head gearing is already covered. But it's just simply take it even further and you know, over your bosoms, that is a command of God to them. Not command of their husbands or their father or their brothers or their sons, but command of God. Yeah, but how can the state decide what level is right? So what if the state was saying that every woman has to wear the full veil? Because the this interpretation is the with the state, like they're Who? forcing their interpretation on everyone else. They're saying like we're the ones that know okay. and we're right. the ones that will tell you. Exactly so we need to we need to look at the best interpretation. The Quran tells us what's the best interpretation of the Quran. Whenever you dispute, whenever you have a disagreement, return to Allah and His Messenger. And the Quran says this is the best interpretation. So the Quran explains about it, and the Prophet Muhammad explains um, you know, what these words mean in his life, in his words, in his actions. So, so when, for example, what is a dress code? The Prophet you know, explained to us in words and action how it should be, the, the, the sutra, for, uh, not sutra, the sutra, you know, the, 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 the aura of a man and a woman. What's the basic uh, minimum? The maximum is, for example, you know, you can go up to that, but at least the minimum. And why is it important? Because the clothes is something that if you go back, my brother, at the very beginning of the story of human beings, at one point, you know, when shaitan whispered to Adam and Hawa, and they realized this made, they came to realize that this, you know, the shyness and so on and so forth, and they were trying to cover themselves up. Yeah? So this covering your oneself is part of our natural fitrah, the God, or natural disposition that God's given us, part of our shyness and shame. We shouldn't be like animals, right? And go about this, okay? Because the interaction that between the opposite sex will have, it will have also be coming from the, the physique, the body, uh, and so on and so forth between the opposite genders, okay? So, well, in the Quran, what, what does it say exactly then, that which is like objective and can be understood? Yeah, by so you, do, you don't just go by Quran, remember what I said? Yeah. The Quran so, and the Sunnah of the Prophet yeah, so Islam. And, and this Sunnah, the, the, the scholars of Islam will tell you by the examples of the Prophet Islam, you know, what is the minimum level of aura. So women shouldn't come here and say, you know what, I'm just going to be um, just wearing dress from navel down. Topless, for example. No. Because the Quran tells you, the Prophet tells you, the scholars understood from this text how a woman should cover herself, you know, also the top part of her body, for example. People make issues about the hijab, right? And they're burning hijab in Iran, right? This is totally misunderstanding the role that we have in terms of, you know, our parts of the body and whether they play anything in terms of attraction to the opposite sex or not. Okay? When Allah commands us to cover something up so that in public it doesn't become a, an element of destruction, okay? because it will perhaps encourage you to or get distracted to you in a sexually provocative way and so on and so forth, Allah says no, we don't want that kind of interaction in society. In society, you should be interacting with in all, none of that sexual element in. Just like what you want to do, business, study, learning. Why do you have to infuse that with sexuality? Because when you are discussing teaching children, do you have to really make them promiscuous and say, you know what, look at these drug queens, you know how they wear their underwears and so on and so forth. None of that, because it's irrelevant. 
in, in, in these environments. So Allah gives us against his directions and so on and so forth. So we don't need to have this kind of destructions coming in. Okay? So here, an example of a human being, brother, if Allah makes the hair of a woman part of a sexual attraction in her body, and Allah says, you know, you need to cover this up in public, we appreciate and we understand that. Okay? And we know that from even studies um, in, in studying sociology and psychology. I mean, you're more than welcome to go and read those studies in which this plays a very important role in the interactions of a active nature between man and woman, for example. Well, what about the face? Is the face... So scholars differ. Some scholars say the face doesn't need to be covered. It's you're not under any obligation to cover your face. Other scholars will say, okay, it's better to cover. And others will say you have to. So there's element of disagreement in there. But those scholars who say you don't have to cover your face, your hands and so on and so forth, they clearly have evidence for it. Okay? So maybe the Sheikh can explain about covering their faces yeah. of, of, of women, for example. Yeah, uh, basically that at the time of the Prophet some women used to cover their faces and some women didn't do it. And we have a few ahadith that the Prophet approved certain women not to wear the, head, the, the face veil. And the women are entitled not to, not to cover their faces. And this based on the on many uh, hadith, and many, uh, even the ayah, when Allah says about the women, it's called khamar. Allah says in the Quran, let them as well cover their khamar with this, with this hadith, with the jay, which is the neck and the beginning of the chest to cover it with this hadith. So somebody said you can you pull up all of the khamar, this thing, you, you, you cover it like this. I would say how the women will walk in that case. He said just to see the eyes. What is the dividends of the eye? Let alone that we have two hadith, one hadith that the Prophet ﷺ, he, he, he said to Asma Abu Abu Bakr when a woman reached the age of menstruation, that she shouldn't expose, or that she should cover all her body except the face and her hand. And there is another hadith that the Prophet ﷺ, he was on the way back to, to from Mecca to Medina, from the Hajj, when he finished the Hajj, which was the last legislation. In the area between Mecca and Medina, women came to him and she was known from Khatam, from one of these tribes, and she, she was exposing her face and even she had red cheeks like here. Yeah? And then she came to speak to the Prophet وسلم, and behind him was Al-Fadl ibn Abbas, his cousin. And he was a young man, Al-Fadl, at that time. So Al-Fadl kept staring at the woman. Then the Prophet وسلم, didn't say to her, cover your face. He told, he, he literally, he turned the face of Al-Fadl ibn Abbas away from her, not to stare at the woman. Then he went back again to look at her and then he did the same thing three times. So the point is, he commanded Al-Fadl ibn Abbas not to stare at the woman, but he didn't command the woman to cover her face. Based on this, that we know covering the face is not obligation. That's how it is. But the, but the, but the hijab is obligation. The covering the, the, the head is obligation. Covering the whole body is obligation. And, and, and for, you, for some people to say, okay, but well, I'm, I'm free to do that. Okay, you're free to do that, but there is a harm in the community. There is a harm in others, and as well, the, uh, and the harm in you as a person. To which extent that you can expose? Some people will say only the head, okay? but someone will say the head, the head and the arm, so only the thighs. And to which extent? Where we draw the line? We draw the line as Allah has mentioned and as Allah has made it in the Quran, which is to cover all their body except face and hand. That's how. It that makes sense. It's, uh... <laughs> Yeah, I need to read more about the, the hadith and the yeah. sunnah to see. Yeah. But it's, uh, so yeah. as, a, as a believing brother, the first and foremost thing to, to, to get acquainted with and practice and implement and make it your everyday you know, habitual thing is the prayer, five daily prayers. So if you were not practicing regularly with five daily prayers, you know, start with the prayers um, and understand why you have to pray in the first place. Why do we have to thank and, and be grateful and show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I mean, the air that you breathe. I mean, stop breathing the air of Allah and see what happens to you. You're going to die. Stop drinking the water that Allah has created and, and placed here in this world. You're going to die. Uh, so we are grateful for, the, you know, if we were to count the blessings that Allah has given us, we would not be able to count. This is what Allah says in the Quran, you'll not be able to count. So we need to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this prayer, it's not only one in which you are getting, connecting with Allah, your Creator, throughout the day, but you're also showing your gratitude and your thankfulness in the prayers. What you see, what you do, because you are simply saying, no, I'm not going to just let my life live me, but I will live my life according to the purpose of my life. The purpose of our life, brother, is not to just be happy and, 
you know, smoke a cigar and that's it, you know. And no, the purpose of our life is none other than to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the purpose of our life. And how do we do that? How do we worship Allah? How do we worship our Creator? By following what our Prophet and Messenger Muhammad وسلم, told us what is worship. Salah is part of worship. Some Ramadan, fasting in the month of Ramadan is worship. Why do we fast? It's not just because we want to have empathy and have a sympathetic understanding with poor people. Because even the poor people have to fast. Some people who are ill or on a journey, they're exempt from fasting and they can make it up. Or people like women in their menstruation and so on, for example. But for the rest of us, we need to fast when we witness the month of Ramadan. And the fasting is not to, as I said, just to understand how poor people go through their suffering of hunger and so on, but fasting has a purpose. Quran tells us what Allah tells us what the fasting the purpose is, so that we can achieve called taqwa or piety, God consciousness, God righteousness, in, in which you have it's like reverential fear. You love Allah, you want to do everything Allah is pleased with, and you want to make that commitment to do that. And you fear Allah and His punishment and you want to stay away from all that He prohibits you from doing. That state of being is this taqwa in which you want to be in that state. So this month of Ramadan, brother, is a month that is going to train us. It's going to mold us. It's going to be a, a, a development program in which we will make ourselves the people of taqwa in which we will have that state of being in which we will not only be developing positive traits of being kind, compassionate, merciful, just, righteous and many others but we will also at the same time because we are fasting from the evil things we will stop backbiting, we'll stop oppressing, mocking, ridiculing we will stop from even listening to what is not beneficial, haram, impermissible. We will stop from looking at what is not permissible. Yeah? So our body will fast as well as our stomach. God doesn't want your stomach to fast only. He wants you to fast throughout so you condition yourself, program yourself to become a people of taqwa. So this, when you do that, you become a better person, a better Muslim. And you will then able to be fulfilling the purpose of showing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, yeah, I'll try fasting. This guy fasts uh, the whole month. But I just show him every other Muslim. Yeah. Yeah. No, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. fast together. So you need to show him how to pray, inshallah. Yeah, we prayed yesterday. Yeah? Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Because when you pray, you. Just even if you go through Surah Al-Fatiha, I mean, surat, no wonder Surah Al-Fatiha is in the opening of the book. When you say, Allahu Akbar, you start with this and you come in your prayer, what happens to you? You've left everything. You say, nothing is important. Sacred. Noth nothing is important. Allah is the greatest. So my, my work, my study, my, my things I was, business, what I was doing, is, no, none of it is important because I have a purpose of life, which is to worship Allah. So Allah is the greatest. Then you come into a mode of reality. You say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise and all gratitude belongs to Allah, Lord of all that exist. All that exists. So you come to a step of realization that I don't need to just be grateful to me and my employer or my teacher and so on and so forth. You need to show the real gratitude which belongs to God. The real gratitude belongs to God. And you say, when you make that conviction, say, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Because Allah is the most gracious, the most merciful, the ever merciful. He wasn't obliged to give you all of that. When Allah has given you all of this, you're thankful for your life and the substance of your life. Was he under an obligation? You will realize that Allah was not under, brother, I'm just gonna finish this and then you're gonna understand and appreciate. Allah was not under any obligation. He did all of this to you because he was, he is merciful, compassionate. Once you realize this, you neck, you, you, in your prayer, in your state of being, as you stood in front of prayer, you go into next level of reality or realization. Maliki Yawmiddin, he is, because he is not obliged. So what if, Ya Allah, what if some people are not grateful to Allah? 
and do not fulfill the purpose of their life. Rather, they become stubborn and arrogant. Allah, then you realize Allah didn't create all of this in vain. For nothing. He is Malik Yawmuddin. Malik Yawmuddin. He's the owner. He's the king of the day of recompense, of the day of judgment. When you realize that, you know what's going to happen to you? Internally, it will transform you saying, Allah is the one who's going to judge me in the day of judgment for what I do, what I believe, and what I'm doing. So who's going to help me in that day? You move into the next form of realization. You say, You alone we worship, and you alone we seek help, sustenance, and support. Because no one in that day is going to help me apart from you. I have to worship you alone, and I have to ask sustenance from you alone. So that state of being puts you into the realization. You realize, now what I'm going to do now? I'm totally at a loss. I have to worship Allah. I need to be shown how to do that. You say, Show us, establish us on the straight path, the path of those our Shaykh explained, which you have favored with. Not the path of those who have taken that path and, you know, they received your anger or they went astray. So that surah itself will bring you to reality step after step after step. And we'll do that throughout the day. Okay, yeah. I'll, uh, yeah. Thanks so much for speaking to me. Nice to meet you. Thank you, brother. Have a good day. Uh, it's, uh, I'm getting a bit warm in the sun. Can you pray, Asa? Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Why is it sometimes there's two times when you can ask uh, Asr? Yeah, you can ask the Sheikh about so, two mithal of Asr. I have, uh, I have uh, some people say to you. Okay, sure.